Yay! Okay. Ajay, uh, today yeah. we're using some uh, voting format, so some questions are voted up, up, uh, like uh, you see, thirty-seven votes for this top question. Uh, okay. I don't know how many people are friends of this person. <laughs> okay. So well, maybe you can get the votes are, for the the answers. But there are some questions that may be uh, repeated, so maybe I will uh, uh, group them and show them to you and you can answer in one go. Okay, fine. Okay, so I think this one is good. This is the top of the hit parade. Yes. I love my family and I feel helpless when they get careless and unwilling to practice proper hygiene, even after being reminded to do so. I fear for the safety of my baby and elderly parents. Please advise, Sadhu, times three. It's, sometimes it depends how much carelessness and unwilling to practice proper hygiene that they do. And it's a very difficult thing that you fear for the safety of your baby and elderly parents. You've got a good reason to actually to ask the the family, please. And we've got to look after our elderly mum and dad and our baby. And I don't know if you can have a conversation with them. Sometimes when there's a sensitive matter to bring up, you have to find the right time and place. If the baby is grabbing most of your attention, as babies do, sometimes it's difficult to have a conversation with a person. But what I would try and do if there was something like that happened in a monastery, then you take the the problem maker aside and just have a, a friendly chat with them. And if it's un, if it's carelessness or unwilling to practice proper hygiene, I don't know, you can maybe just put more bottles of uh, alcoholic hand wash around and more things, you know, leave them all over your, your home or wherever you're talking about. And because when the things are there, people are much more likely to use them. Uh, but if you know you have to walk even just into another room to wash your hands before touching the baby, your elderly parents, it's more difficult. And if you get your elderly parents on side as well, you can ask your parents to say, look, mum and dad, we don't want you to get COVID. We want you to live you know, as long as possible. So can you please tell the other members of my family you know, to make sure that they have proper hygiene? And before they come here, because if the elderly parents say that, I think yeah, they're more likely to listen to them. And if it depends on your elderly parents exactly how um, elderly they are, if they're very strong, strong willed, you can tell, ask your elderly parents to tell the people who are not being careful with proper hygiene. You know, the elderly parents should tell you if you don't wash your hands before you come in here, if you don't sort of, you know, uh, you know, use a mask maybe if you feel a bit ill. If you don't use proper hygiene, I am going to take you out of my will. I'm not sure. I think some people in Singapore, Malaysia, that then they start using proper hygiene. Otherwise, they don't go in your will. I'm not sure what you use, but sometimes we have to be quite uh, strict. You probably would never take them out of your will. But nevertheless, you have to make it clear to everybody in the house how important it is. And use the person with the most authority, which will be your elderly parents, I hope. And anyway, it's best I can do. Wow, I feel like I'm angry at my entire generation before me for the conditioning of my current state of mind. I feel frustrated for being the one to break the cycle and hold such a burden. Please advise me. Look, anger at your entire generation doesn't help at all. Now, what does that achieve? What does that, what positive things come out of that? And so sometimes there may be an argument, there may be an argument to be angry if it's going to achieve a better world or at least make some improvements in our life. But a lot of time, angry people, all that authorities see, all that your family sees, all your generation sees, is your anger. I don't see the cause of the anger. 
And you must point to people like a, a Gandhi or a Mandela. Mandela was very angry at first, but he had a almost like an understanding that anger and violence would not lead to freedom for his his country, would not lead to a state of uh, respect amongst people. That anger gives the people who are against you an excuse to ignore you, just an angry young man or an angry person. However, if you put that anger aside and you say your truth and your reason honestly and uh, with good arguments, then people listen. Just like they listened you know, to a Gandhi, you know, who did the amazing thing of pushing out the British Raj from India. It's an impossible thing to do. But he did that without violence, because that violence became incredibly powerful. So you're angry at your entire generation for the condition of my current state of mind. Oh my goodness, you can actually recondition your current state of mind. It's not that hard to have wisdom and kindness and peace and happiness inside. That's why we come to these retreats for. Because conditioning is, that's what it is. It is um, just how the people you meet, the things you listen to, and the thoughts which you encourage and allow to persist in your mind. That causes that conditioning. If that can cause that conditioning, it also shows you that how that condition can be changed. So not your entire generation, but associate with really nice, good people, like the people who come on this retreat and listen to you know, nice talks or learn how to do some meditation. And you find the conditioning of your mind you can change. It's much better to change the conditioning of your mind with positive things than just to waste time being angry. So don't just be angry, do something about it. Just recondition your mind, meditate, associate with good people, and then you'll be much better. The next question, how different are the pity and intensity. So the Piti Sukha in Anapadisati is very contented, beautiful, really happy to be here. And the inner jhana is a wow, amazing, beautiful. And just, you know, you're there, you're still, you don't say wow, but that's how you experience it, a very powerful, deep state of rapture and peace. There's a trouble because, you know, once I start talking about jhanas, then lots of people want to attain them. And if, because they want to attain them, that sometimes they lower the standards of what really is a jhana. And there's a couple of things you must always remember. And that is that you know, in those jhanas, the five senses have stopped. You can't hear sounds. You can't feel the body. And you can't you know, see or smell or taste. Those five senses are just stopped. For the sixth sense, the mind is incredibly strong. And it is still, in other words, that you can't think. And people who have the, the notion that you can think inside a jhana and decide what to do, that is, that's not still in, that means your mind isn't still, it's not a real jhana. Now, you know, I think everybody should understand that thinking is a very disturbing part of the mind and it's not that necessary. And each one of you have had these moments when the mind is so still, there's not a thought in the mind. And, and the idea of saying a thought or thinking a thought in your mind is just, it's like disrespecting the stillness of these powerful states of mind. And it's, they're not really describing anything real. It's it's a sort of approximation to what you're experiencing, but you don't need those words to describe what you're experiencing. Instead, you're just powerfully enjoying this moment, and that's more than good enough. So, pity and sukha are far more intense and far more refined. I mean, a lot of difference in the jhanas. And in the 11th step, or oh, in the 11th step, 
that's uh, just when you brighten up your nimittas and you uh, you keep the nimittas still. I think you're meaning samadahang, uh, samadahang chitang, and sampasadhanang chitang. Those two steps of, of anapanasati, just before you release the mind. This is, again, it's not what you do. It's just how you learn when you have nimittas, you have a jitta, an experience of jitta, an image of the jitta to work with. You learn how to keep it still. At the same time, learn how to make it more powerful, more beautiful. And of course, the experience of the Piti Sukha, again, it's growing enormously. And these would be the most wonderful experiences that you've ever had in your life, by far. And of course, in the jhanas, that joy, that happiness and bliss is even more intense. Wow. And as they say, it's, as the Buddha said, it, it's the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of letting go. We call it Nekama Sukha and Sambodhi Sukha. And mostly it's the bliss of being free from the five senses. So in the uh, beginning of Anapanasati, especially the Piti Sukha, which comes up at stages five and six, that, that Piti Sukha is still, you got awareness of the body because your mind is getting strong, but it hasn't really sort of taken off yet. And when you get into the body disappearing and your mind being very focused, oh, that's so powerful. And of course, when the body disappears, there's incredible joy and bliss. And then, of course, what about the Piti Sukha of the second jhana? And that's a totally different flavor of Piti Sukha, far more refined, I, more intense. And sometimes I would say it's more refined uh, Piti Sukha. And it's a Piti Sukha of absolute stillness, where the mind isn't moving at all. It's totally still. Just on the, it's on the joy of stillness. It's the samadhija, piti sukha. The piti sukha, the bliss, which is born of stillness, real stillness. The mind isn't moving at all, and the will has just disappeared and gone. You stay like that for such a long time. You're not moving. The mind isn't moving. It's perfectly aware and very blissful. And of course, it gets to even more bliss in the third jhana. More refined because it's the, the pity part of it vanishes. And even the fourth jhana, the sukha part of it vanishes, but it's like contentment. I prefer the word contentment these days to upeka. But even there, you know, it's supposed to be upeka between happiness and suffering, but even there, the Buddha recognizes, said that's upeka sukha, the happiness, the, content, the happiness of contentment. It's another flavor of bliss. And I call them flavors because that's the best word I can get to describe them. And again, we run out of language when you get to these mental states of jhanas where the body vanishes because uh, we haven't stayed there long enough. I'm, I'm saying about most human beings haven't been there enough to really be able to describe what it feels like. You haven't got the language for them. Anyway, that's my little explanation there. So next one, next question, if you wish. I have, um... oh yeah, sorry. I thought it was the same question. Ask steps one to 10 of Anapanasati volitional world, i.e. instructing and steering the mind until one enters the first jhana in step 11. Is step 12 is where we enter the jhana. Or does each step of the Anapanasati happen naturally? <laughs> now that is an excellent question. You can, you can will use volition in the early stages of, sati, of, early stages of Anapanasati if you wish to, but it's unnecessary. So you, if you wanted to say, I'm going to watch the breath, or I am going to just you know, decide to make my breath long or decide to make it short, you can do that if you want to. But as you go deeper into Anapanasati, into meditation, you will discover that your will 
is actually just disturbs everything. And after a while, you don't need to use that will. And when you've meditated a lot, you just stop using the will as early as possible. So, you know, even as I've mentioned to you, and as I've taught you in the, in the guided meditations, it's much better just to you know, make the mind peaceful. That's about where your will stops. And then you find that present moment awareness is established in you. And the silence is established in you. And the silence means, you know, you're not putting things into words. And when you have that silent present moment awareness, the breath will come to you naturally without any volition. And because of that time, the breath is very, um, very light because you're not doing anything. You don't need so much air coming into your body. Because it's very natural, it becomes very beautiful. The Piti Sukha is what replaces the need to have a will. It just it becomes almost automatic. Something which is beautiful, the mind goes towards. And it's just like, I got to tell some monks, if a beautiful girl comes into the monastery, they look at her and they just say, oh, I didn't want to. It's just, it's a training, conditioning. So if you see a sunset, you go looking for it. Because beauty draws the attention into it. And when you have a beautiful, delightful breath, of course you're going to watch it. And it's this is what the mind does. It inclines towards the beautiful. And as that delight just grows in the so-called stages of Anapanasati, as your lotus opens, the inner petals get more and more delightful. You just you get pulled into them. It doesn't become a choice anymore, it just happens. What you can do is you can have a choice to interfere. Sometimes people make the will, I'm going to make it happen. Or they make the will, this is a bit too much for me, I don't want to do this. And they get scared to let go of their will. But if you just go for the beauty, the beauty is much more powerful and it stops the will happening. Just if you want that, I'm trying to use similes. If you're watching a beautiful concert, then it pulls you in. And you don't need to will to listen. You just can't stop listening. And it's a similar but more refined when you're just watching your breathing. It pulls you in. You're watching this breath and it's delightful. And it becomes so delightful that, you know, nimitas start to come. And then nimitas, they just pull you in. And I don't know why this is the case that sometimes when you get to nimitas, that's when people start to you know, think, now I can start controlling. Now I can do this, do that. And please just let it all be natural. Don't get involved. Your whole job, as I mentioned in the simile of the thousand petal lotus, is just to be kind and be mindful, that's all. Nothing else. And kindness is that open the door of your heart to whatever's happening. It's no naturally without will, without volition. And then, of course, as you go deeper, any type of will deeper in the, the meditation really disturbs the meditation. And so you know, sometimes the people get so close, and then they say, yeah, this is it. Or say, no, I don't want to do it. They feel afraid. And that just really destroys a piece of the meditation. So just let your volition, your will disappear. And just be peaceful. This is an automatic process, especially the high stages of the Anapanasati. To get into jhana, you have to let go of the will. It's called renunciation. You don't steer it, you let go. What was it? There was this, this uh, woman who was meditating at one of my retreats. And you know she was getting to do some deep meditation, not quite the jhanas yet. But I told her the story, the simile of it's like you're, you're, you're driving your car. And then to be able to let go enough, you know, to actually get the jhanas, you have to imagine you're letting go of the steering wheel, taking your hands off it, and letting go of the pedals, taking your feet off the pedals, and just letting the car do the driving with a driverless bus simile. And if you let go of all those things, then the jhanas are very likely to happen. 
And so she had this dream that night. She had to tell me the following morning. She said that, you know, she was driving in her car and who was in the passenger seat? Ajahn Brahm. It's only a dream. It doesn't happen. So I was in the passenger seat and she lost control of the car and it was just going down this hill really fast. And she started to uh, become very, very anxious. And I told her, take the hands off the steering wheel, feet off the pedals. And in a dream, she did that. And then it went to this cliff, this really dangerous cliff. And we're going to both go over and be killed. And I told her, take the hand off the steering wheel, feet off the pedal, don't touch the brake. And so both of us went over the edge of this cliff. And as it was going down to what she thought was certain death, going really, really fast, she noticed that the, the car was you know, pretty stable and balanced. And at the bottom of the cliff, there was like a, a curved um, road, like um, curved, like vertical at the beginning and then getting flat after the curve. And we, we took that fall and it was actually quite comfortable and the, the car never smashed. But then it was going very, very fast at the bottom of the, the hill on the flat part of that curve. And then there was a sharp right turn. And she wanted to get hold of the steering wheel to move the car to the right. I said, now remember, keep your hands off the steering wheel, feet off the pedals. And she did. And the car turned that sharp right corner at high speed all by itself without any problem whatsoever. And then both of us were going along a very flat, safe section of road at the average speed. And she said, yes, in my dream, I did that. I had the confidence to follow your instructions. And so I said, now go sit in the meditation hall and follow the instructions in meditation as well. Taking her hands off the steering wheel, her feet off the pedal is scary to some people. But you know you're perfectly safe especially you have a bit of trust and confidence in your teacher. And then you find you don't need that volition will. And the mind just goes in these deep meditations all by themselves. Remember the story I said this morning, or was it this morning or sometime about the, oh, it's this morning, about the mangoes at Wat Bapong. The only way you can get those mangoes is sit perfectly still, don't do anything, don't use volition. And the beautiful, open your hand out, open up your kindness, compassion. And then everything will be fine. And you'll say, well, I can't believe that. But that's actually how you get deep meditation. I never believed it when I first heard that from Ajahn Chah. When these things start to happen, you say, oh, what a wonderful simile that is. So the deeper states of Adapadasati certainly happen naturally. The earlier stages, well, you can do some will if you want, but do it naturally earlier is the best. John, there are a few similar questions. Would you like to read them all before you start answering on Anapanasati? Okay. This is uh, the next one. Other five hints is totally absent when enters into first jhana at the 11th step of Anapanasati. Uh, at which step of Anapanasati does the body disappear one is completely absorbed into the mind? I'll do this very quickly because each one has to be. I will forget the ones at the end. Uh, does first four jhanas with a jhanic factors are called all within step 11, like the lotus unfolding? It's like step 12. I don't know where you get 11 from. Is it? No, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It's releasing the mind. That is actually where the jhana happens in Anapanasati. But the first and fourth jhanas, it depends on how peaceful your mind is when you enter the jhanas. It's like how much the, the, the main factor to put it very simply, is how much you let go, how much renunciation, how much power of just giving up you have when you enter a jhana. And if you have a lot of letting go momentum, then you go into the deeper jhanas. If you only have a little bit of letting go, you can just go into the first jhana. But once you get into the first jhana, you know, the second jhana is a special case of the first jhana. It's a deepening of the first jhana. It's inside the first jhana, and the third jhana is inside the second jhana, and the fourth jhana is inside the third jhana. All inside one another. You really do a lot of letting go, you go deep inside. And when you come out, you come out the same way you went in. And so uh, it's all like the 12th. The lotus is unfolding at the 11th step, but then when it starts to unfold, that's the 12th step. 
Each diner has assembly needing a bath, powder, cool water, lotuses, white cloth. Are these imagining are these experiences of step 11 after one enters first diner? It's again the 12th. But anyway, uh, these are similes that are trying to give you some description. They're very hard to give the descriptions. The simile of the of the uh, the bath powder is that just the water, the bliss of renunciation just fills the whole experience. And the second one with the cool water, it says that cool water is coming in, but nothing is going out. The mind is so still, you're inside and nothing is leaking away from it. And oh, what's the third simile again? But the fourth simile of the white cloth, purity. And that's the simile of the white cloth. And they say it's the purity of awareness in the, in the fourth jhana. And that purity of awareness is as a, an important part of that because sometimes people think that in jhanas that you have no mindfulness. You have incredible, that's a peak of mindfulness. You can't get more mindful than that in the fourth jhana. <coughs> and so that's why the Buddha said it's pure and, and powerful. And okay, the bath powder cool water, lotuses, a white cloth. Oh, that's a lotus which it arises you know, into the water from the water. And it's just always very pure. And the third is, if you like a lotus, cool water, a lotus is a, a much more refined beauty than just cool water, which is the difference between pity and sukha. Because you experience what those jhanas are. And then afterwards, when you come out afterwards, you don't sort of have any uh, movement of the mind to actually to say anything about these states while you're in them but they're very very powerful so you remember them with accuracy when you come out wow that was amazing what was happening there and afterwards you can use those similes uh, to understand which journey you were in if you want to but you know for me just these are just so incredibly wonderful states you don't need to you know, have um, to measure them and to say which one it was you know, because if it's a beautiful experience of jhana, the main thing is that's going to have removed your five hindrances. And then you can start to get amazing insights into, you know, what's been removed, what's gone. So I often ask people, you know, who want to practice their insight after they've emerged from the jhana, not to think what was there in the jhana, but to contemplate, to explore rather, what was missing, what disappeared when you were in these jhanas. Not the factors which were present, but the factors which were absent. And that's where you get much more insight from. So just even like the first jhana, in the first jhana, what's absent is the body and the five senses. And that's the cause of the bliss. You know, these things are conditioned cause. The absence of a body causes incredible bliss of a mind which is really, really, really quite still. And then when the Buddha says this body is suffering is dukkha, even when it's young and there's no sicknesses and it's fit and healthy, then you understand, but when it's disappeared, it's even more happy. And of course, the second China, what's missing is the will. You can't do anything, you can't move, you can't think, you can't make any decisions. And then you understand that is the bliss of the second jhana based on the will vanishing. It's samadhi ja piti sukha. And that means you understand that this will, which a lot of times people take as a personal possession they, they have to keep, you see it as suffering. I mean, really intimate, deep suffering. You can't, I don't know how anyone can actually see that is they haven't had experience of the second jhana. But you know, these are there for you, and this is what happens. And you come out after these jhanas, whoa, some things have different some things have disappeared. Okay, next question. As a Buddhist, how to stand up with a body because of different social status without being aggressive, especially in a society being soft and calm is being seen as the weak. Thank you. You can be soft and calm, but it doesn't mean that after the bully has left you, you don't actually use that soft and calmness to complain to the 
other people in the organization whose job is to stop that bullying. In many parts of the world, certainly Australia, certainly places like uh, UK, so being bullying is seen you know, to be just um, counterproductive to harmony in the workplace or in the family. And it's a big problem for all parts of the economy and the happiness of the nation. They have laws against that. They have people who are there in the big companies or there in even police stations you know, to actually make sure that bullying is stopped. So, you know, you can be soft and calm to someone and stand up to them. So it's not just soft and calm, it's soft, calm and courageous. And courage doesn't need um, being aggressive. Courage is in the strength. You know they're in the right, stand up and say, look, this is not uh, acceptable. And if they do something like hitting you, now then, go straight to the, the people who are supposed to enforce the law. I know in some societies that might be difficult because of different social status. But I'm not sure you may correct me on this. In Singapore, I don't think there will be a problem complaining about the bullies. Maybe I'm not sure in Malaysia, there may be a problem there. And uh, but certainly that our modern world is getting more and more aware that bullying causes big problems for such a long time that it really is worth stopping. And we can do that. So I don't know which society you're actually talking about, but many societies that they make sure that bullying stops. Do Ajahn, what should a person focus and meditate on during the last few hours of passing on and also just at the point of the last breath? Thank you for your guidance. <laughs> if you've done lots of meditation before, just you, know, you can start with loving kindness meditation, maybe. Well, you know, I'm just rushing ahead here. Loving kindness meditation, get some joy up in your mind. And of course, separate from your body. That happens naturally when you meditate. Well, sorry, that happens naturally when you die, obviously. <laughs> The five senses turn off. And if your five senses turn off, then what happens next? Sometimes have the outer body experiences when you have almost like a, a meta state of five senses. They're not real five senses, but what you have, they call a mind made body. And that sort of has senses. You can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. But it's not with the eyes or the ears and stuff. But then eventually, people, what do they do when they die? They go to the light. What is that light? That's a nimitta, that's the mind. And if you have a pure life, and the last moments are pretty pure and good and joyful, then of course that light you see would be just wonderful. And then you know what to do with nimittas if you've you know, gone to these meditation retreats, how to just be able to enjoy them, leave them alone and get sucked into them. And it becomes like jhana experiences, or what some Christians say is like going to a heaven and meeting God. It's not meeting God or going to heaven, but I can understand why they feel like that. It's beautiful and wonderful. And you can get a really amazing rebirth. Or maybe, I don't know, if you have enough dharma, maybe end the whole of rebirth right there. So, but it really depends on where you're coming from. At the very least, Make sure that all your family don't get so upset when you're dying. If they start crying and say, oh, don't leave me, don't go to the light, stay around, we love you so much, send them out the room. Because dying is a very private moment. You do it by yourself. And if they sort of stop you or oppress you, then it's the time for them to leave the room. So let me die by myself. Which is one of the reasons why you, I'm sure you've all experienced this or heard people say about this. Sometimes you may be with your grandma and you know, she's about to die, you're with her holding her hand and she doesn't die. So you'll go out, just have a quick lunch or quick supper or something. And while you're out in the room, that's when she chooses to die. Why? Because again, the dying is private. 
It's one of the most amazing experiences and other people can't help you. If it's, I'm saying this, but if it's a monk, sometimes I've done this, being with someone when they're dying and give them some advice on how to do it and how to let go. Just give them some encouragement and some um, instructions on how to die. And the other thing, of course, is you know, before even you, you get to that point, remember all the good things you've done in your life. And yeah, you may have done some very bad things in your life. You may have two bad bricks in the wall. Actually, maybe more bad bricks in the wall, but don't think of them when you die. You also got lots of good bricks in your wall. So this huge account of kindness and generosity and making merits and, and helping set up you know, Buddhist societies and, and Brahm centers and stuff, you've done some amazingly good karma. So you may have done something really nasty at the end, but remember the good karma. Focus on that. Like I said this morning, you associate with the good, with the beautiful. Develop the perception of the beautiful. So when you die, but beautiful is these perceptions, nothing to do with the pain or aches in the body. And then that just carries you with a very powerful mind to be able to do some really good letting go at the very end of your life. And have these amazing experiences when you die. Beautiful stuff. So meditation is actually just learning how to die. Do it well. Uh, jump on. Does Theravada Buddhism have the concept of Amitabha Pure Land? No, actually we don't. Do we have a sutra on Pure Land? No, we don't. Should we be inspired to be born in Pure Land or to attain Nibbana? Now, people think they can get to a Pure Land and then from there get to Nibbana, nice and simply. But, you know, the, the simple way or the shortcuts are usually dead ends. We have something similar in Theravada Buddhism which is you now the pure abodes of Sudarwasa. This is probably where the idea of pure land actually came from. But you know, to get to the Sudarwasa, the pure abodes, that's the realm of the anagamis, the non-returners. So the non-returners, it's usually by doing a lot of deep meditation like jhanas. And just at the end of their life, that's where they get reborn. And it's, it's land they can go in and out of jhana but they've got these very, very, very refined bodies and they'll never get reborn into this world simply because they just don't belong here. The five senses have been seen for what they are. As I mentioned to you, when you experience like a first jhana, even just the first jhana, you realize just how um, ugly and painful and how much a burden, that's a word I was looking for, how much an irritation and the burden these five senses are. Not as a theory, you're not being negative, this is the truth, you see that, experience that, because you have something much, much better. Or the simile which I used some time ago, it's just like um, a person's born in a prison cell, and they, they go to school in the prison cell, or in the prison, and they sort of get a nice job in the prison, they get even married in the prison, they have kids in the prison. And the prison has got these five big walls, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So they can't see beyond the sensory sphere. And they, they do quite well in prison and they just help each other in prison, very kind people, but they're still in prison, in this jail. And then sometimes, sometimes this rebellious monk comes along or nun comes along and teaches you to actually to go past those five walls and see what's beyond in the realm of the mind. When you see what's beyond in the realm of the mind, in the jhanas, see all these five senses disappearing. Can you imagine this human life is like a prison. And you know how to get day release and deep meditation, or sort of many days release or real release. So you don't need to come into this prison of the five senses ever again. And that's the anagamas and non-returners. Still attach to the world of the mind, but that's an easy thing to, to transcend. It's the five senses, it's a tough one. Imagine if you did see what the five senses were, you do have nibida towards it, the sense of what am I getting involved in this for? Which means that when you meditate, you close your, your eyes and you don't attend to the sound and you sit perfectly still. And then you're very willing to let go of these five senses. It's easier to do. 
So you can attain these deep meditations so much more easily. And that's pure. It's pure of the body and the five senses. That's a pure land in Buddhism. Dear Ajahn, is it a must to experience jhana during meditation in order to train stream entry? Please advise. Thank you, Ajahn. That's a great question. I've answered it before, not in this retreat, but it's a very common question. It's a great question. And there are two types of stream entry, going into the on the path of stream entry and the full stream entry. And that is, in, even in the suttas, there's a lot of... Um, lack of clarity there, even in the suttas, because um, what really made me understand what's going on was if something is, has to happen, there's no other way it must happen in the future, then it's as if it has happened. So if you're on the path to being a stream winner, you haven't entered the stream yet, but you're on the path. Sometimes they say it's like you've attained stream entry. Just like in the movies I used to see as a kid or as a young boy, when you really upset the head of the math mafia, and then they say, oh, you're dead. But they're still alive. Yeah, but your death is so certain, it's as if you are dead. The walking dead or whatever they call it. So if the stream entry is absolutely certain, which it has, once you get the path, you have to get the fruit, the end of stream entry, at least by the time you die. So that's why sometimes you see people, the, the most amazing to me, but it really confused me for a while. You know the story when uh, Devadatta and King Ajata Satu were trying to assassinate the Buddha. And they sent this assassin to kill the Buddha and then sent two assassins to assassinate the assassin, four to assassinate the two, eight to assassinate the four, 16 to assassinate the eight, and 32 to assassinate the 16 just to destroy all the evidence of what actually happened. But what actually occurred when the assassin, it was employed, you know, a professional assassin found the Buddha, the assassin just, just could not bring himself to murder so this amazingly powerful, kind being. And so he just asked forgiveness and said, I'm terribly sorry, I came here to kill you, but I just can't do it. And the Buddha sort of forgave him, gave him some Dhamma, and that assassin became a stream winner. There was no um, jhana there. There was no satipatthana practice. There was no taking five precepts. There was no giving dana. This was just an assassin. Became a stream winner so quickly, so easy. And I thought, how can that happen? And of course, for me, the solution is that he entered the path of being a stream winner there. So seeing the Buddha, having this incredible faith in this amazing being. And so I'm supposed to go and kill him, but then I just can't do it. I've never seen a being like this before. And that faith would have made it inevitable that that assassin would take five precepts, would start to practice dana, would start to meditate and start to listen to what the Buddha was teaching, if not the Buddha, his close disciples. So because he had incredible faith. His attainment of stream winning would be, um, would have to happen. But the actual attainment of stream winning, one of the most important of the fetters, the samyochanas, which are discarded, is the idea of a self. And I cannot see how that can happen unless one has uh, experienced a jhana. To understand what this self is. And the simile which I use, I was going to tell this tomorrow, but here it comes now, was the old simile which I made up of the, the tadpole and the frog. A tadpole born in the water, lived all its life in the water, can't understand water. No matter how intelligent that tadpole is, you can't really understand what water is when you've lived in it all your life. And so one day the tadpole grows into a frog. That's a frog can jump out of the water. And I can imagine the sort of experience of a frog being outside of water for the very first time in its life. There's something which has always been there is missing. Water. And only now can the tadpole understand what water is, whence it's missing. 
the same way that things like the body, you can only understand what the body is, really, personally, experientially, when the body disappears in the first jhana. You can only, and you're still very mindful. You can only understand what the will is when you enter a second jhana. And the will is one of the most important parts of who we think we are. And of course, the last part is your consciousness. And as you go deep into the jhanas, your consciousness vanishes too. It's what disappears tells you that these things are not you. And that's how you experience the stream entry. So you need a jhana to enter stream entry to get the attainment. Okay, next one. Hi Ajahn. You mentioned about being more aware and to think less. How can I do this and still be good at my job? I do a lot of research, writing reports that requires planning and strategizing. Thank you. Now I was just uh, uh, reading an article today. It was on the, the ABC website. That's the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I thought it was really interesting because it was uh, the importance of employing people who are in the autism spectrum disorder, uh, auto, autism spectrum. In other words, that people who find it very difficult to get jobs because they, they cannot really impress on the interview system. They, you know, they find it difficult even to make eye contact because you know, they're on the autism spectrum. But if you give them a job, Sometimes that their abilities are so amazing, they can do way better than just an ordinary person, an average person. And so there's a group which are like asking those in autism spectrum disorder to join this group and they bypass all the interviews. And they get them incredible jobs in big business and also in government. And they, they create an what they call autism advantage for the company or the group. They can do things, they can see things which other people can't. And it's an amazing asset for the company or for the other people who employ them. And so this is why being a more aware and to think less, to do things differently, more aware, think less, you get more ideas. So you don't think the ideas, they just come to you. And you become much better at your job. You're not an ordinary employee. You're someone who's much better than, all, than others. Example that one of the, the uh, is a Thai woman, she was highly intelligent, came over here and studied and got a job in the, some social service department and ended up being the one who had to sign the last papers when the government took children away from their mothers because their mothers were incapable of caring for them. They may be drug addicts or violent. And it was one of the most difficult things in the world to remove a child you know, from their mummy and to do it right. There are some occasions when it has to be done. Many occasions it's a totally wrong thing to do. But she had to make that decision. And she came on one of my retreats years ago and really late. It's an incredibly stressful job. But then you know, she was a very good meditator. So she let go of all that stress and meditated, and enjoyed some peace and quiet for a few days. And then during one of her very peaceful meditations, she told me at the interview afterwards, she had this, all these amazing insights on all these so difficult cases which she hadn't solved yet. And she, you know, she went to her room, wrote down all these innovative solutions, and then just uh, put the paper away and then carried on meditating, have some peace. But she, she was amazed that when she didn't think about the problems, but she meditated, had some stillness and peace. Innovative solutions came to her. She wasn't trying to make those solutions come. She was still and peaceful, relaxed. And then when the mind was ready, they threw up these incredible solutions. And that's actually, if you do research, write reports, planning and strategizing, sometimes you have moments of not planning and not strategizing. 
In other words, you have moments of courage and exploring areas you never explored before and seeing what comes up into your mind. You don't plan at all. My job, as you know, giving talks, sometimes uh, people say, do you plan your talks or plan these answers? Of course I don't. Sometimes I just give ordinary answers, but sometimes when you know, you're in the zone, as I sometimes call it, other people call it that as well, sometimes you give these amazing answers. And it, um, sometimes it impresses me when I'm talking. I said, wow, where did that come from? That was amazing. It's as if that I allow, I have the confidence to give you know, ordinary answers, but then sometimes you don't plan, don't strategize, you're not afraid. Amazing answers come up. Oh, that was great. Anyway, dear Ajahn Brahm, I am full, but should I force myself to finish the food? Because in Buddhism, we don't waste food in a dilemma. <laughs> if you're full, don't force yourself to finish the food. You don't want to waste food, but there's so many other beings can actually take that food. And sometimes those beings are, are the birds outside. Or over here, I mean, those have been to body and monitors, you see how much people bring. And we can't meet a fraction of that. But then afterwards, we put all that food in the bucket, or in some bins. And one of our, one of our disciples has a, a chicken farm close by. So we, they, they eat all the leftover food with some monks leave. So the chickens are very happy with us. And we give so much happiness because, you know, we get really good food as monks. They try and give us the best. And so the chickens, I asked the person, are the chickens getting fat? And he said, well, I know if they're getting fat, but they're very happy chickens in the chicken farm close by. So don't force yourself to finish the food. Find an innovative way of not wasting it but not eating it. Dear Ajahn, what is the Buddhist view on euthanasia in animals? We seem more tolerant to it than euthanasia in humans, but isn't euthanasia against the first precept, even if we're done out of compassion? If you look at it, it's not breaking the first precept. I think many of you have heard me say this before. It's to kill another being, Parnati Pata, that is against the precepts. But to decide that you do not want to have that medicine which prolongs your life for a few more days, which is killing yourself, that is not against the first precept. You are an owner of the karma, your karma, heir to your karma. So what happens with animals? You've heard me say this before, it's a beautiful answer to the question. No human being has a right to kill that animal. It may be your pet, and maybe the vet was saying that it really is in pain. And this is where Buddhists get a lot of conflict. Should I tell the vet, yes, kill my cat? It's really got a lot of suffering. But that's killing, or should I keep it alive? I'm not supposed to kill anything. And then that poor cat is suffering like hell. And the answer is to ask the cat. It's a cat's decision. Or if you have a dog, it's a dog's decision. And dear old Judy, who passed away a few years ago, she had a dog, very bad cancer, took it to the vet, spent a lot of money with every possible way of trying to alleviate that cancer. Nothing was working. So one day she took it to the vet and the vet said, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. The animal's in pain. Can I have your permission to euthanize it, to kill it? And Judy, a very close, good disciple, she took the dog aside to have just a minute with my dog. And when she was alone with the dog, she asked the dog, as I instructed her, do you want to die? I looked into the pet's eyes. And you know, she'd lived with that dog all her, you know, for so many years. And so she got the feeling very clear. She told me the dog didn't want to be euthanized. So she went back to the vet and said, sorry, I'm taking it home. You're not going to inject it. And all oh, that vet was just so, I gave Judy such a scolding. You Buddhists are just so, so unkind. You say you're compassionate, but you know, this poor dog is suffering. 
So she took that scolding and took her little dog back. And then six months later, and it was about six months, she took the dog back to the vet. It made a full recovery all by itself. And she took it for a checkup and the vet was just so, so surprised. Said, what, that's the same dog? It's perfectly healthy now. I said, yes, I didn't want to be euthanized. The dog knew. And the vet said, oh, you Buddhists are so wise, so compassionate. <laughs> she got the opposite from the vet this time because sometimes but it's not our job to tell the, the pet that it needs to be euthanized. Ask your pet and you always get wonderful answers. And this is actually how you treat your animals. And in humans, again, it's your choice. If you, you know, just want to take euthanasia, but in most countries now, that you have to have some good reasons. You can't just take euthanasia because you're fed up one day. But if you have like some of these very long lasting um, diseases, which are very painful and you have low quality of life and you make that decision, it's your decision. And no one else could take away that power for you to make that decision. As long as it's done with a clarity of mind and with a compassion. And you're not breaking the first piece up. First piece of it is about killing others. I've meditated for 14 years and been to many retreats, but I rarely experienced a deep sense of joy, happiness that you describe, but rather a calmer sense of bliss and equanimity. Is this normal? Yeah, everything is normal. So, but don't, again, I mentioned already that don't try and achieve these incredible bliss and happinesses. The more you try to achieve this, the less it's likely to happen. But then what happens one day that you just, Everything is going nice and peaceful and calm. All the causes are there. You're in the present moment. You're not going anywhere or doing anything. You're just enjoying the contentment of now, but more deeply than usual. And then suddenly, you just these things happen all by themselves. You get into a very deep state of meditation, really peaceful. And it surprises you afterwards. You think, wow, this is real. It happens. And eventually you just get into like nimittas and some of those nimittas incredibly beautiful. And all these things which I talk about, you experience for themselves, wow. And then eventually a person, people do get this. Not everybody, I have to say this in this lifetime, because sometimes they don't do as much, much meditation as they could do. If you really get into the meditation, you have retreats or even when you retire from work and you have more time and you really get into it, of course it's going to happen. It has to. And those become one of the things which drives you into deeper meditation. Not your wanting, not your sort of goal setting or ambition. It's the joy and happiness that just takes you along the ride. A deeper and deeper powerful bliss. You can't stop it. Oh, yes, you can stop it, but please don't stop it. Next question, and after this question, we'll have the toilet break. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, during meditation, I have trouble getting into a comfortable position, feel my body relax. The more I try, I feel my body tense up more. Should I stay within my body still, and how can I let go? You know, I would actually tend to tell this person, just stay with your body and just learn how it relaxes. Don't try the same old things. Just experiment trial and error, until you can actually relax your body. One little trick which somebody taught me, and it works so beautifully, that if I have a, like an ache or a pain in my body, just in one part of my body, that sometimes that just around that pain, the, the, the body sort of inflames and gets very tight. Is your body tensing up? And in order to get rid of that, I don't press further into it to actually to lessen that area of pain because then the pain gets more intense. So instead I tend to go in the opposite direction and expand that pain, to spread it further through my body rather than keep all the body free of that pain, only just one area which is really tight. Now you imagine this pain, and maybe it could be say in my throat if I've got some uh, cough or irritation there, it starts in my throat and I expand it. 
don't try and get rid of it. I spread it out. So it goes up to my my head and down to my my torso. And keep on spreading it until it takes over all my body and even gets further than my body. As I, as I expand the pain, it just gets less dense. I'm actually just diluting it. And I don't stop until I spread that pain over the whole universe. And it's so um, light, and what's the opposite word to dense? But you can't even feel it anymore. I expand it rather than push it into a little corner. And so that way you can actually learn how to relax your body. And if that's all you do in your meditation, you learn how to let go and see the body relaxing. That's a wonderful thing you've learned. And when you get that fixed, you've learned what letting go is. Just let this moment be. You've learned kindness to your own body. So your body is your little laboratory, your, your place where you test out these different things you're doing or things you're not doing and see what works for you. You try this, try that, be courageous, be innovative. And then eventually you do feel your body relax. Well, what did I do? And then you do that many times and you realize, yeah, what caused my body to relax? Present moment awareness, not thinking, kindness. Just expanding things, not pushing things into a corner. Whatever you call it, you have your own words for it, but it works for you. So I keep on going until you find just how to relax the body. And then some meditations, just say not just getting bored with always fighting or uh, struggling to get your body to stay still. Sometimes sit in a more comfortable chair or lay on the bed and just in a, or lay on a recliner somewhere so your body is just really as comfortable as you can get it. You'll never find it perfectly comfortable unless you get into the deep meditations. But it can be much more comfortable than it is now. And that gives you so much joy and happiness. Something's working. Okay, and to get the body to relax, now is a good time to go to the loo and have a nice... And even when you go to the toilet, if you're doing what we call a number two, not just urination, but defecation. Relax, don't rush it. And this is what we learned in meditation even. We learn to just really relax all those muscles and so the stuff comes out without having to have hemorrhoids and stuff because you force it. You don't need to force anything. You really relax to the max. And then you're even a, it's actually basically toilet training. So you don't force things in your life. And then you have less problems. If it's tough coming out, it's probably because you're dehydrated. Drink more water. So everything's nice and loose and can flow out. Anyway, that's my Ajahn Bar's medical advice, <laughs> even though I'm not a doctor. <laughs> okay, so have a little five minutes of going to the loo and then we'll see what to do afterwards. And actually that, I don't know, just, I like to tell a joke every now and again. So those who haven't gone to the toilet to keep you happy, somebody reminded me of this old joke, which has got a, a slightly rude ending, but it's not really rude, but anyway, that this was about the, the fellow who was going to work in the mines in north of Western Australia. And he was concerned that he was going to leave his wife alone in the house. And there were some really bad people around the area. So he went to the pet shop to get a, a guard dog to protect his house while he was away. And so, there you go. So he's, um, he went uh, to the pet shop. And the pet said, you want a guard dog? I said, yes, protect my wife when I'm away working. He said, I've got the very best dog for you. Just wait for a moment. He went around the back of the shop and came out. And out of his pocket, he, he brought out this tiny dog. 
and you know, like the, the Chihuahua dogs. He said, this is not a guard dog. You're trying to sell this useless dog to me. And the pet shop owner said, be careful, sir. This is not an ordinary uh, Chihuahua. This dog comes from mainland China. It was brought up by the monks in the Kung Fu monastery. He's a Kung Fu dog. He's, and he can be very, very aggressive. Look, I'll prove it to you. And he pointed to, there was a cardboard box in the corner of the shop. He told this dog, dog, Kung Fu that, do that box. And the dog sort of ran to that box and with its claws and its arms, bang, 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 bang. And in about two minutes, that box, that cardboard was, was like it had been through a shredding machine. It was just strips of paper, that's all. And then the, the owner saw an old chair in the corner and said, dog, Kung Fu that chair. And even though the chair was solid wood, the dog bang, 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 bang. And that chair was reduced to matchsticks. That was a very tough dog, even though it was very small. So he said, yeah, I'll buy that one. That'll save my wife. I won't have to feed it very much either. And so he took it home. And when he went into the house and his wife saw him, he said to her, oh, she said to him, did you get the dog? He said, yes, I've got the guard dog. Where is it? And he took it out of his pocket. His wife started laughing at him. You call that a guard dog? Don't be stupid. The vet has sold you, you know, a fake dog. It's a scam. It's only a small dog. You won't be able to chase a fly out of the door, let alone, you know, a, a burglar or someone, you know, up to no good in my house. And at that, the man said, be careful, wife. This is a Kung Fu dog brought up in a monastery in China. And it is really violent because it's learned Kung Fu. You know what the wife said? <laughs> Kung Fu dog, you stupid husband. Kung Fu my ass. And that's what the dog did. <laughs> she couldn't sit down for weeks. <laughs> Some people get that stupid joke. <laughs> but anyway, that's my character. And you know that by now. We don't expect stuff like that. Uh, and I don't know what you expect. Anyway, that's a Kung Fu dog. Anyway. <laughs> so, shall we go to the next question of people back now? Okay. <coughs> You're right, this is my karmic reward. Dear Ajahn Donut. <laughs> that's me. Ajahn Donut. Remember why you call a donut? Round, sweet, and holy inside. I am retiring soon in 2021. Oh, you're a lucky thing. I, see, I seek Ajahn advice how to pace a lifestyle towards a more spiritual life while still being a householder. Thank you, Ajahn. A good thing is to join something like the Buddhist Gem Fellowship or the Buddhist Fellowship or Bodhinyana Singapore or the Brahm Center or any of these wonderful organizations. You have a bit more time and you also have a lot more um, encouragement to do good things in your life when you've still got the energy you're not really old yet and you know you can still be financially independent so because you find when you do hang out and spend time with spiritual people they really help you it's the, the Kalyana Mitta idea and the Kalyana Mitta they sort of bring you along they can answer some of your questions go to retreats together and you really feel that in your in the later part of your lifestyle, in the later years, you're actually doing something good for others, amazing things for others. And, you know, I do a lot of work and I get tired and sometimes I use that as inspiration. You know, I, people send me emails and uh, the letters just saying just how much I've, I've helped their life. I mean, really helped them, saved their life. And that just brings me so much incredible energy. So, you know, the goodness which you do in your lifestyle by joining one of these amazing societies, getting good Kalyana Mittas and making a difference in the city in which you live. Wow. That is a wonderful way of spending those last years of your life. And then learning meditation, getting great retreats, and then developing your mind. So 
Kelly Island Midlands is the most important part there to be able to join some of these amazing groups. And if you can't join groups, because you know that some of the people on this retreat are from all over the world. And if you are in these uh, remote parts of the world, then at least you can, you know, the Buddha Society of Western Australia, you know, just we sort of acknowledge that people haven't got a Dharma Center near them. And so we try our hardest to have online things for you and even just online uh, way sacks, online everything, so that at least you feel a part, you know, a member of this international Buddhist group. So that's another thing you can do if you haven't got a group. But the best thing there is seek a city close to you and then just join those Buddhist groups and really serve. Dear Ajahn Donut, <laughs> what's the difference? <laughs> I, I really appreciate you calling me Donut and these things because it shows you're not afraid. And sometimes the fear you have to a teacher and to see the over respect you have, I know you all respect me, if you over respect, then sometimes you don't feel confident enough to ask you know, really deep questions. So thank you for calling me that. And I mean that seriously, sincerely. What's the difference in purpose of chanting, meditating and sutta readings? Which one is the most important when time is a constraint? It's time is a constraint. I suppose meditating is always the best. Because when you meditate, you can understand the suttas. And chanting, the chanting has power then. But it really depends you know, what you have to do. Sometimes it's best to do a bit of each. You just meditate with no suttas. Sometimes the meditation is misunderstood. And the suttas actually give it a grounding in how the Buddha taught. Chanting can also be really, really useful and can inspire you. But don't just chant things you don't understand. Chant them, learn what the meaning is. And so whew, sometimes when you're chanting something, it really, really just gets your heart going, really inspired. So that's when I chant, I know the words. And I don't know if I said here, but I said, I think, oh, just a few days ago in the main hall here in Bodhinyana, there's some chanting I just cannot do. It's too powerful. By that, I mean that when I start chanting, I, I know the words, and it just so it sends me into deep meditation and just can't stop it. It just inspires. And so you know, I was doing this chant you know, quite regularly and just I never finished it. It's only about five minutes, one or two minutes, and oh, you're off in beautiful land. So anyway, so find some chant which really means and inspires you and meditate as much as possible and, and do a bit of... Um, of suit reading as well. Here we go. Dear Ajahn Brahm, in Anapanasati Sutta, is step nine to 12 description of jhana state, while 13 to 16 steps are the Vipassana one in deep stillness leading to relinquishment? Thank you. No, the ninth and twelfth, the ninth step is experiencing the chitta, the mind. That is when nimittas arise. And then Samadahang Chitang and Sampasadhanang Chitang. This is actually learning the two parts of working with nimittas is actually learning how to keep that nimitta still, but increase its power. So it becomes incredibly strong. I, sometimes I get the 10th and 11th the other way around, but that's not really so important because those two, you can you don't just do not 10 and then 11, you do 11 and 10, and a lot of times you do 10 and 11 together. And then the Wimochiang Chitang, that's the twelfth step, and that remote change the freeing the mind. That's a an idios, idiomatic word. It means always means freeing the mind. It's always the idiom for the jhanas. So the twelfth is where you enter the jhanas, and the thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth is what happens after you emerge from the jhanas. And after you emerge from the jhanas, you know you you can see just see the anicca is not rise and fall, and it shows disappearance, uncertainty. It means that something which was always there, like water, is no longer there again. It's disappeared. It fades away and it sort of ceases, the next two. And it's uh, a renunciation. I think that's the 13th. You see the power of renunciation when you let go, what happens? So a lot of these times, they happen naturally. 
what will you do? Anyway, next question. I settled into stillness and calmness during meditation. Wonderful. However, I do not feel joy as often described by you. I feel emptiness with neither pleasure or pain. Please advise. Ah, now that's a really good question. One of the best I've had because many people experience this. And because for some reason or another, when we practice any religion, we always tend to sort of not encourage the joy and happiness. When I used to go to the Christian church as a young man, only to sing in the choir because I got some money for that. <laughs> it was a good little earner, as they say in London. And I went to marriages and sang in the choir for Anglican marriages. And oh, the, you know, the bride and groom always gave me a tip. I must have been a really good singer. And I really, I enjoyed that because, you know, get some money to buy some fish and chips or whatever. And I never told my parents about that. I just, I'm going to church. So it's my own little money. Uh, anyway, um, but the, the churches were so cold and hard seats and there's stone everywhere, just really uninviting. And just the sermons were always going to go to hell, you're a bad person, blah, blah, blah. And there was no real happiness and joy there. And I sometimes wondered that you go to some meditation retreats and it's just like going to a concentration camp. You know, just it's, they torture you. You've got to get up at a certain time. You've got to sit for a certain time. Your legs ache, your back is in pain and no one cares. They think, oh, you go through that. You can get enlightened. And I always say to people, the Buddha taught Anapana Sati. The Buddha never, ever taught Anapana Sati. <laughs> Mindfulness not with pain taught the middle way for goodness sake so when he went to a place like how Ajahn Chah taught him the it was fun to be with him it was inspiring he was a really kind monk and that's where sometimes that you realize that sometimes we don't even look for happiness and joy in our meditation and that's actually if you get a nice still and calm state see if you can see the joy in that the beauty in it. And once you start developing that, you see the joy is there, but you've ignored it. But sometimes you think, no, if I have any joy, I'm going to get attached to the joy. And so you push it aside when it even starts to arise. You don't get attached. Well, you do get attached to the joy, but it's the attachment which is good. And the Buddha said, get attached to the joy in meditation. Because if you get attached to the joy in meditation, it leads to the four stages of enlightenment so like anything else just be able to watch the breath or develop loving kindness it's it's like it's there in your meditation so look for it and when you find it just value it and worship the happiness in meditation and then after a while you feel the emptiness neither pleasure or pain but no you won't feel that it becomes joyful Could you elaborate more on Nimitta and which sutta can I look to understand more? Is this happened to everyone prior to first jhana? Yeah. The sutta is the Upakilesa Sutta. I think it's 128 of Majjhiminikaya. Upakilesa Sutta. And if you get the usual translation, which is done by wisdom publications, and this translation done by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, you look through that sutta, Upakilesa Sutta, U-P-A-K-I-L-E-S-A, -E and you won't find the word nimitta mentioned at all. Because the Bhikkhu Bodhis translated it as that thing. And I really tried to argue with Bhikkhu Bodhi, but please, you know, put the word nimitta in there. He said, well, it is in there in the footnotes. But the footnotes is not really good enough. It doesn't bring its attention that this whole sutta is about how to deal with nimittas when they come up. And all the problems, upikile, so it means the, the, the refined defilements which affect nimittas. And you know, how you deal with that. So there's a whole sutta, but so many people miss it because the word is translated into English in a word which you know, doesn't really mean very much, just that thing. But you check it you know, in the footnotes and it said that thing means nimitta. 
you can check it in the Pali. It's just, you know, I don't know how many times it's mentioned in that sutta, maybe 15 or 16, 17, 18 times, a lot of times. So that is a sutta about nimittas. And that's where the mind starts to get so strong that the, uh, the five senses just get overwhelmed by nimitta. If you want to read more on nimittas, and elaborate more, because I've only got apparently 10 minutes left on this session, that get out that book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. And otherwise, what was the, uh, the B Buddhist Fellowship published a copy of that, and I think it's called, or is it uh, Happiness Through Meditation? And there's a whole chapter on nimittas and how to deal with them. And Ajahn Chah talked about them and they're real and they're important. They do happen to everyone prior to the first jhana. However, sometimes you can go through those nimittas so quickly that sometimes people get the first jhana, they don't basically notice they've gone through nimittas. But it's best if you want to practice meditation a lot to get to know the nimittas and how they work, what they are. So I'll refer you to that book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, otherwise called Happiness Through Meditation, where I go into detail about nimittas. Ajahn is liberation of the mind in the 12th step to let go. And do we tell our mind to do that so that we can become equanimous or is it a natural process of jhana? And if so, so which jhana? It's a natural process. The 10th and 11th step, that is just where you have, again, strengthen the nimitta with power and stabilize the nimitta with stillness. And of course that's gonna happen. You go into the jhanas and you can't, well, you can't stop them, but sometimes you're afraid. I know one monk I'm very close to, I've got to be very careful what I say, that, you know, his trouble with entering the jhanas and from the nimittas, it's like he, the door is wide, up, wide open, you've got jhanas just over there, and it's easy to step through. But, you know, you have to let go of your will and what you think is yourself. And so it's a bit scary, but it feels so nice. But, you know, this is a big step, but the jhanas look so delightful. And just, but you know, what am I going to lose? That looks so gorgeous, but I can't, but I must. And you just get pulled in. Now, you don't think like that, but that's just describing just the joy of these experiences overcomes all fear and all sense of control, all will. And you just get pulled in by the, the bliss of it. Ajahn, what should a good Buddhist do when facing observing someone? utter hate speech intolerance. What if it is, was a government or religious body who said these things? Well, first of all, they might say hate speech or practice intolerance, you know, be out of, of range of those people so you don't get uh, hurt or imprisoned or even just killed by this hate speech intolerance. Fortunately, if it's a government who does those things, that just the other governments in the world usually just uh, give them a lot of trouble uttering hate speech or intolerance. And you know, they use uh, whatever means they can to basically punish governments, not allowing their senior ministers to go into their country or taking away the opportunity to, to invest in their country or whatever. And that's a basically a good thing they can do that because powerful people need other powers to stop their intolerance or their hate. And the rest of the time, those who you know different religions or different uh, gender or different sexual preferences, that you know, we have to make sure that you know, we're such wonderful, good people. It means we have to be better people so that the hate speech intolerance just can disappear people of their religion, people of their culture. So why are you so afraid of Buddhists or of gays or of people of different ideas? These are wonderful people who contribute to our society. So why are you using hate speech or intolerance to wonderful people? These people are your friends, your next door neighbors, people who really give to the world. Why have intolerance? Just a quick answer to a very deep question. I don't think I've sort of answered it totally, but 
I haven't got that much time. Imagine I have a girlfriend, but find myself deeply attracted to a married woman. There's mutual attraction, and I've broken the third precept. I'm deeply remorseful, but find it hard to stop. Please help me. Okay, you have a girlfriend, and just talk with the girlfriend about this. If that girlfriend is going to be really a deep, true, trusted friend to you, who maybe you can marry in the future, you've got to share everything with her. And I'll find that time to tell her what you've done. And hopefully, as I've mentioned earlier in these talks, to have a relationship with someone has to be built on trust. And that trust is only really achieved when you can say terrible things, which you have done to your girlfriend or to your boyfriend, to your partner in life. You say, look, I really didn't want to do this. I'm really sorry what I've done. Help me, girlfriend. Now, don't punish me or shout at me or break off the relationship because that will just make it worse for me. And it will just make it worse for you too. Just help me. So if you have a relationship and someone comes up and tells you the terrible thing they've done, please understand the reason they're telling you is because they look up to you. They trust you. They're admitting their faults. So listen to them and see if you can help them make sure they never do that thing, bad thing again. And I've done that with married people. And so wonderful when a husband has really hurt the wife you know, by having an affair or something. And I get both of them to give forgiveness to one another in front of a Buddha. And usually the, one of them, say the girlfriend, puts you on probation for a while. Say so anything else you do, then that's it. You've got to prove yourself. And then that's a, a path which you can do. Really, you have to, if you're attracted to a married woman, it's easy to be attracted to people, but you can't, it's like going past a shop window. You'd love to buy that item, but you realize you can't afford it. It's just too expensive. And being attracted to a married woman, you must cut that off. Where do you see that woman? If it's someone you work with, move. Don't have that same place in that same office. So that actually you don't see her that often. Change your email address or your, whatever it is they contact, the Facebook address or whatever, so that you, know, you don't have contact. And the girlfriend will tell you those things to do. But being attracted to a married woman, that is bad karma. So there's mutual attractions. And sometimes some of that attraction is the attraction of the forbidden. The forbidden fruit is always more attractive because she's married and you're not to you. Sometimes that causes much of the attraction. So please cut it off. If you have a girlfriend, that's good enough. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahma, I experienced such joyful and blissful states during after your guided meditation session. Thank you, Ajahn, for your wonderful compassion. Your my deepest gratitude. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you so much. That's one thing I miss in these Zoom retreats. You don't see people, so I don't get feedback that easily. Ajahn, I've wondered why there were cases of monks and nuns who practice meditation yet suffer from cancer. They should have good health throughout mental bliss. How is it not so? <laughs> Thank you. There's all sorts of karma which happens in our life. Maybe even the Buddha had a bad back. And uh, even many other, even Ajahn Chah had a stroke. And so they practice, it's amazing meditation. But I always remember Ajahn Chah, the reason, this is my idea, he had a stroke. There obviously some karma there, but also he gave so much towards the end of his life. You know, from early in the morning to late at night, he was just giving monks, lay people, and then he hardly rested. And I think that's really what causes his uh, brain damage. Too much work. And sometimes uh, when I work hard, I remember that and say, come on, I have to take a break as well. I have to take a rest. You may have good meditation, but it's the mind which meditates, not the brain. And the brain has to learn how to look after itself and take rests. 
So yeah, monks and nuns sometimes they suffer from cancer, but usually, sometimes it's uh, karmic things from the past. And there's not much you can do about that, but it's also, if you're not uh, karmic from the past, and sometimes there's a lot you can do with something like a cancer. Of all the diseases, I think well, that's one of the ones which meditation can really help. Okay, I know this is my last question, right? So can we do one more question? Because, you know, I, I'm happy to carry on. What's the best way to help a friend who may be feeling suicidal? As this friend has a terminal illness, is likely going to lose his dignity with increasing disability. He finds no meaning in life. It's incredibly difficult to help someone like that. All you can really do is to you know, give him kindness and support and just basically to, to tell him, committing suicide, make sure that you've, ex you've experienced all the possibilities you know, of any sort of, you have a terminal illness, but sometimes terminal illnesses, they change. I know so many people are terminally ill, and then for some reason or another, the terminal illness disappeared and, and vanished and they were fine. So you don't really know a terminal illness and lose your dignity with increasing disability. What is your dignity? It's not what other people think of you, it's how you think of you. And sometimes you see people with increasing disability becoming wonderful human beings and they really learn and grow from that. So they don't be afraid of that. And they give other people the opportunity to care for you. And, and sometimes some of those things are wonderful. You find no meaning in life. That person, the meaning of life is learning how to give. Learning how to give to others, give other people the opportunity to look after you and be kind to others. So much you can still do. Disability doesn't mean no ability. You've got a different type of ability. And sometimes I've been with People are supposed to be disabled, and they're amazing people to be with. But you've got to be sensitive to find out their incredibly wonderful qualities. How are you doing? Is it time to end for supper? Or another question? Last one, John. Okay, last one. Here we go. Then you can have a rest. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so I don't end up like a child. I'm a long way from that. I've been learning meditation for a while, but don't think there is great progress in calming my mind, apart from realizing more quickly that my mind has wandered away. Can you please give more advice? If your mind wanders away, you go with it. And be kind to your mind. You may be learning meditation, but I think it's the kindness, the compassion, which is the weak part in your meditation. And just demanding too much. That's one of the reasons why being content and easily satisfied is one of the ways of getting deep meditation. When you want it, you never reach it. When you don't want it, it comes to you. And there is not great progress in calming my mind. Sometimes you don't realize how much progress there is. So don't make that decision yourself whether you've made progress in calming your mind or not. Ask the people you live with, your friends, your partner, if you have a partner, people you work with. And sometimes you're surprised, you think you haven't made progress, but other people see enormous progress in you. You know, I've, I'm a donut now, I've got fat. You know, I never knew when that I started getting fat. I can't see the progress. Just one day I woke up and oh, I've got a big belly now. How did that happen? Because these things on you, they, they, they creep up on you. The same thing, your progress in meditation, the calm, it creeps up on you. You don't see it really happening, but now, wow, I'm calm. That's what my friends say. That's what my parents say, and it's true. So anyway, just carry on meditating, and you'll find this is true. It happens to everybody. Excellent. So I thank you all for listening. And I hope it was a nice session for you and a nice session today. And I have another session with you tomorrow and then we have the closing session in the evening I have with you. I wish you all happiness and well-being and may you all have a beautiful night. 
See you tomorrow. Sadu, sadu. sadu. That's more like it. Yay, sadu back to you. <laughs> Very good. Thank okay. you, Ajahn. Bye. Good night. Thank you, Ajahn. Good night. Good night.